Welcome back to the podcast, everyone. My uh, guest today is Tyler Friel. He's the writer for Outdoor Life and host of Tundra Talk Podcast. Thanks for uh, being on, man. No, thanks for having me, man. Good to good to good to get catch up with you again. I was glad to. It was nice to to chat with you in person here when you were up in Fairbanks. Yeah, I gotta admit that uh, when I was when I was there underneath all the um, the sheep that I see in your background right now, it was kind of intimidating. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's it's I don't know if some people aren't used to all sort of eyes looking at them, then then it could be a little it could be a little different, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, yep. Yeah, I just pack and packed as many of them in here as I could get. Yeah, it, you know they they talk about. You know, the people who are anti-hunters say, well, why do you need the all that stuff? And it's it really is that memory. And one of the things that, like, you knew, like, details about each one. And if you just glance at them, they all look the same. But you know the difference between, like, this one was this age and then this one was broomed or it's broomed on one side, the double broom I got there. And then it was it was pretty sweet to just to have that. The recollection of each one, and I have the same thing, you know, with the with the antlers that I have for deer, man. They're just beautiful things, and they just represent those memories. And to have them out to look at, it just reminds you of why you do all that. Oh yeah, big time. Um, you know, like <laughs> you know, there, a lot of people wouldn't be able to tell you the difference between any of them, but I, you know, just having them there to look at. I mean, it's a big, big reminder. I mean, it, just looking at them it brings up all sort of memories from each individual hunt and. You know, st- details that, that unfortunately they start to get fuzzy as years go by and, you know, that having something tangible that can really like put you back into that moment. I mean, that's what it's, that's what it's all about is it's not, not really about a bragging type thing. It's, you know, most, most people that, that get animals mounted, it's a, it's a, a way to kind of relive those experiences over and over again and preserve, preserve memories. Yeah. Even if it is a, a copy of a copy of a copy that ends up like your memory ends up being a little yep. less sharp than the original, you do know that the original was cool in some way. So even if there is a yep. little <laughs> bit of embellishment, it's still it's still legit. Oh yeah, yeah for sure. So when you're going into that, like, is there anything at all that ends up being kind of routine, or do you ever get an idea of? Well, you know, why do I still do this, or is it one hundred percent fresh each time? Yeah, it's it, it can be sort of sort of routine, um, and some aspects of it, like I've, I've I've tempered a little bit. Like the first few years, man, especially if I'd had I, my, I would get emo way more emotionally involved. I I think in previous years, you know, I'd get way more amped up. Now, you know, I, I don't even get that excited about it till I start like getting into sheep country and then it gets exciting. And, uh, you know, I used to, if I'd had ram spotted and, and put to bed, I, I wouldn't be able to sleep at night. And, you know, you just wondering, and I don't know, maybe it's just experience knowing that, you know, it's, it's probably going to work out. And I know, I know the routine, but every, every one, every experience is a little bit different. And man, there's just not there's nothing i mean there's very few things that just get my heart pounding like the you know when you crawl up over and you've got sheep right there and it's gonna work out and um yes i mean it's it's just a each one's unique in its own way there there's a lot of similarities but it's definitely enough to that i I haven't got sick of it yet yeah (laughs) that's good i think the some of the biggest things that i i think about then i kind of worry about Still, just the logistical issues, you know, if I'm going to take my boat out somewhere, you know, is the weather going to be good? And then are there going to be other people at the spot that I want to anchor? And so all those things kind of go into it. So my biggest, like, apprehension are those sort of things. But when it comes to getting on the mountain, then I'm totally relaxed. Do you get really worried or somewhat worried about, you know, people being in the spot or logistical issues getting there? I know a lot of the stuff that you do, you've just scouted and you don't do flyouts every year, so... What what's the most um, yeah. nerve wracking thing? Otherwise, other than getting on there, uh, it kind of depends on the spot. I know usually, especially if I'm going by myself, which I, I don't do a lot, but I have done several times. Um, I get super anxious right up, like at the moment where it's time to 
take off. I mean, I feel like I'm going to throw up, you know, and it, there's just but so much diarrhea. stuff like that. Not diarrhea, <laughs> not yet. Anyway, um, there's so much stuff going through my mind, you know, wondering just all that stuff. In some spots, you know, I get stressed out about certain obstacles that I'm going to have to encounter, whether it's with the four wheeler or, excuse me, or just, I mean, all any number of obstacles. And like you said, yeah, what happens if there's people there when I get there and, um, any more, uh, you know, I just try to take it as it comes. I try to compartmentalize it. And that's really sometimes what you have to do. I think when you get such a huge endeavor, I mean, there's some, some trips where just the entire, or, you know, even just riding four wheelers in, it's just super stressful. Cause you know, you know, you know, you're going to have to come back through here and maybe the conditions are going to be different or maybe the rivers are up. If you have to do stream crossings and, you know, you're just teetering on destroying your equipment and, you know, there's all these what ifs and you kind of just have to take one obstacle at a time and, and put it out of your head until it's time to deal with it again for the most part. I mean, that's that's how I cope with it anyway. Yeah. So how does that compare to, we'll make it a little bit more time relevant, uh, how does that excitement compare to your uh, spring bear program that you got uh, your, probably not days away, but your weeks away, I'm sure, right? Yeah, weeks away. Um, we'll see when the ice goes out. It's been getting really warm, so I, I would expect the ice is going to go out here, what, it's the 21st of May today. So I bet in a week to 10 days the ice is going to go, and then I'll usually give it another week or so after that to flush out, and then the boat's in the water and getting baits in. Um, it's, it, it's, it is different but it's a similar kind of excitement with, with bear baiting. You know, you put a, so much work into it on the, on the front end, uh, preparation and kind of setting the stage and checking and, and, you know, when that bear you want to shoot, I usually, I usually, I get excited when I first see a bear. And then when I decide it's bear, I'm going to shoot. Then the heart really starts pumping and it's time to like start breathing and remind myself that it's just a bear and, and all that. And, and grizzlies are even worse, you know, up because it, it just seems to take so much more time and time and, and effort and, and just repeat, you know, persistence to get, to get good opportunities at them than black bears. But yeah, I, I love it. I mean, I love sitting, I love sitting in the woods at nighttime, listening to the birds and just enjoying it after after being cooped inside all all winter yeah how long does it take to kind of get used to that because i you know prince of wales doesn't have brown bears uh revilla might have some on the east side you know i just not encounter uh black uh, anything but black bears all the time so how long does it does it take to kind of get used to being in grizzly bear territory or do you ever really get totally comfortable i know when you and your guys are are talking about it you you become able to sleep, but you know, do you ever feel a hundred percent comfortable? Yeah. I mean, I, and I get ner. I try not to, to, to be anxious or worry too much unless there's a reason to be, you know, and like for me where we're, where we're at, there's a lot of bears, but it's going into bear baits that I know, you know, for grizzlies frequent that makes me a little nervous sometimes, or if, you know, it's not to say I'm not going to do it, but it just kind of, I try to heighten my, my awareness level and, and my anxiety level to, I try to, I want to have it match the, be appropriate for the, the given situation. And, uh, I don't know, it doesn't, you know, I just don't have, you know, the excitement of, of hunting them and stuff is something you, you can learn to cope with a little bit, <laughs> but, you know, so I think that varies from person to person too. You know, some guys can't ever get over buck fever um, or, or, or don't, I mean, I, st I still have to remind myself to breathe and, and it's like the longer it, the longer that bears there and I've got to look at him. the word, you know, the black bear I shot last year, I had to watch him for 20 minutes before he gave me a shot and, you know, just having to breathe and calm myself down and, and remind myself it's just a bear, you know, um, so, yeah, I don't know. In some ways you never get used to it. And if you, you totally do to where you, you know, where it doesn't get your, get your heart pumping a little bit, then it's probably not exciting enough to be worth doing anymore. Yeah. Uh, Jesse Nock took me out to where he shot that last 
Well, I'm sure he shot a couple. He shot a couple good bi- good bears, but the one he had he made that little film about a couple years ago. I went out with him a couple weeks yeah, afterwards, yeah. and I just got to see that whole layout because I've never done done bear baiting. I've just kind of the the program of waiting out on the flats for something to come out and then shooting it. So just <laughs> just yep. seeing where his setup was, and he's like, "Yeah, the bear was right there," and I'm like, "Dude, that's crazy." But there was at least like he had like an escape route. I was thinking, okay, escape route. If anything yeah. weird happens, like this is how he would get out. Um, how does that differ when you're up there in the interior? Like, do you have because it all just seems kind of forested. Um, what, what is what's the lay of the land layer? How do you choose your spot, and then you know how do you how do you access? Yeah, it's um, I broke up there right at the end, but I think I think I got the gist of it. It's uh, it's super forested where it, in all the places I hunt, pretty much you know it, you can't you have zero visibility. Um, I try and, and I tend to hunt, I've got a boat, so I tend to hunt river country and I, you know, it's, it's pretty common. A lot of rivers in the interior, you know, animal, all sort of game travels up and down them. And there's kind of river corridors that a lot of game is concentrated in. And I'll try, you know, I base where I'm picking baits off of a couple factors, you know, try to pay attention to prevailing winds and, and then also spots in the river where, where I think, you know, I'll do a little like Google earth scouting and spots, topographical, uh, you know, topographical features where that I think will funnel critters into downwind and the prevailing wind to where, you know, I think the, the best chance of them getting the scent and, and finding the bait's going to be, you know, and that's, that's a lot of the battle and, and guys find it's not near as easy as you would think, um, just throwing a bait out and expecting there to be bears on it, um, especially you know to one to be really productive. It takes and it takes a lot of time and and some trial and error. I've I put baits in in spots that I think would be just absolutely dynamite and they never even get touched. And I there I don't know why, but uh, but yeah. And I tend to I guess the other thing I look for you know in the interior I like putting I like putting baits in stands of big big spruce. Um, you know, us saying big timber is a totally different is totally different than what you guys think of big timber. But up here, where you got a lot of alder stuff and and black spruce, and this is you know, I mean, it could just be my personal. Everybody's got their own way of doing things, and and it's just the things I look for. I like putting baits in stands of, of big spruce trees, um, a because they're nice for tree stands, and it just seems like bears like that big dark timber with, you know, brushy, real thick cover around it that they can feel comfortable in. And how has that changed? Because you've, you've shot a couple with a compound bow, right? But then you've become more primitive archery. Like how has that changed your adjustment? Or is it just the same thing? You just got to wait for them to get closer? Like how does, how has that changed? Yeah, I've never, I've never actually killed anything, any big game animals with a compound. Um, oh, you skipped right I, I had one. Yeah, well, I had one for a while, and uh, I had one for a while. I just saw the UPS guy, and I just got bored with it. So um, I just found myself not shooting it that much. So I, uh, I had switched to shooting a traditional bow about, eh, about ten years ago, and and started and killed my first big game animal with a bow with that. And, uh, yeah, so I've just kind of stuck with that and it's been a lot of fun. And I, you know, I've been shooting recurves and, you know, modern recurves for a while. And, you know, the whole stone, you know, I killed a bear, a couple bears with stone arrowheads. Um, you know, that was kind of cool. I'm, I, I kind of picked these weird, uh, what would you call them? just weird goals kind of off the off the cuff goals that seem totally random and so some gets stuck in my brain and then i just have to have to do it do it even if it doesn't make any logical sense like shooting one with a mu- like shooting grizzly bear with a muzzle loader you know my wife's like i understand the traditional archery thing but why would you just want to take a crappy old gun <laughs> yeah well think about the traditional archery that's pretty cool because it, it, it puts a lot of extra work in there and it's not just like a a showman type thing like you you put a lot of time into that and you do your shot of the day when you do your shot of the day is it literally like one shot like you're putting everything into it make sure you're doing it right or or do you do a couple shots each day 
No, I, I shoot quite a bit each day, or I try to, um, even in the winter if it's just in my garage. And I'll just take, I, 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 I record a lot of my shots to kind of, you know, fine tune whatever I'm working on, see what I'm doing. I find it to be pretty helpful um, form wise. And so I'll just take one of those shots from during the day and post it as like the shot of the day. You know, it's kind of, it's a little corny, but I've gotten the habit of it. And, and it's kind of, it's been cool because I've saved a bunch of them on like uh, Instagram highlights so I can see my progress. And sometimes if I, uh, if I, if I'm having trouble, like earlier this winter, I was, I was having, I can't remember what was going on, but I just, what things weren't feeling right. And, and I went back, you know, to, to a different time I could see, and I started comparing the differences to kind of diagnose what I was doing. So I don't know, it's half hobby, uh, you know, but, um, I, 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 I like, like doing, doing it. it. Yeah. So, and it helps try to keep me accountable. You know, I try to, I try to post one most of the time. So it keeps, keeps me shooting my bow and, and, uh, and staying on that. Cause if I don't, yeah, if I don't do it, I'll lose it. Yeah. I talked to a couple of buddies and they said that like, you know, try that one shot a day thing. That way you don't get used to the first shots, your throwaway. And by the time you get to yeah. five or six or seven, then you're kind of honing it in. You know, when you're out yeah. hunting, you're hoping for one shot and you probably won't get yeah. any more than one. So I was like, oh, that's yeah. a pretty good principle. So I, I've kind of gone back and forth between just shooting a ton each day, but then also kind of putting that pressure on myself where you're getting exactly this one shot. You got to make it count. All right, we're back. I'll admit to the little, uh, we had a little delay. My internet went out. Which uh, happens very infrequently, just uh, whenever I really need it to work, I guess. Yeah. And then, uh, so you were checking your smoker. What do you got in the smoker? You said you got some uh, some bear? Yeah, I, uh, I made about, today I, I smoked up about 40 pounds of uh, bear snack sticks. And uh, so I'm trying to clean out all the, all the bear meat I, I put in there for that purpose last spring before I hopefully start shooting some bears this spring yeah is that how you do most of it i'm just going off on on bear cooking stuff now because yeah. i have no yeah. idea where we we stopped a couple of minutes ago there's no uh, there's no finding yeah. that yeah <laughs> yeah no kidding um yeah that's that's my f- i mean my favorite way of doing it it just bear meat's pretty lends itself to being really good for sausage and i'm a little paranoid of catching the trichinosis so I, uh, you know, I, I want to make sure everything's real well cooked and once you smoke it and temp check it and all that, like it's done, you know, you don't have to worry about it and, uh, it makes, makes really good sausage. So I'm planning on making some summer sausage, but, um, I really like those kind of smaller diameter snack stick, you know, a little bit bigger than the Slim Jim type of, type of things there. I found they're pretty easy to make. I, I'm, I'm still, I just buy the kits for them and they'll do like 20 pounds a kit and uh yeah they're they're really good my kids love them so we just we just destroy them when we have them so i saved uh i shot three black bears last year and just saved all that and deboned it and packed it and you know kind of chunked it and packed it in gallon bags and put it in the freezer and so whenever i want to make a batch i just weigh out what i need and and go from there what kind of uh like stuffing program do you have do you have one of those like hand crank things did you have an attachment on your grinder or how does that work yeah, I've got I got both. I I started out I had got a grinder used from someone that I mean I knew that they probably only used it half a dozen times or so and it's one of the old Cabela's like three quarter horse grinders and it has a stuffer attachment. Although, you know, I try I try cuz I try I, I for burger, you know, moose burger, anything burger, I like using the plastic tubes. You stuff it in; it just seems like they pack well and they thaw out nice, um, rather than rather than back sealing them. Although, I'll do that too. But uh, the only, you know, that it has several different size stuffing tubes, but the only one that really works well is the smallest diameter one with a little auger that helps pump it out. Otherwise, you just gotta freaking jam it, you know, jam it through there, and, it, and it's difficult. Or I found it to be difficult. So I, for larger sausage, like summer sausage and uh, brats and stuff like that, I bought one of those LEM, just the five pound, you know, crank, crank ones. And that seems to work really well for that. I still use, 
I th- and I think the smallest detachment for that that hand crank one won't quite fit those the small whatever diameter they are the sausage stick casings, um, and I've I've heard from guys that that those hand crank ones can be pretty difficult sometimes when you mix cured sausage like the sausage sticks or summer sausage because they start the meat um, part of the cure is it it start acts as a binder and starts making everything super sticky sticky and 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 uh almost solidifies it but that auger on my grinder does a good job of like pumping it through you still have to stuff it like mad but it will it will pump it through and give you a nice consistent fill and then how do you check the temperature that was one of my problems when i was doing those caribou sticks is i got it i had to i had to rig my own little stuffer because i didn't have the attach i couldn't find the attachment on my grinder so i cut out the corner of a of a vacuum seal bag and they cut off the bottom yep. of a funnel and was just pushing it through there. And it was, it was awful. I didn't feel smart <laughs> at all. Um, but, but then when I put it in the, in the oven, I don't have a smoker. Every time I checked, it didn't seem like it was up to temperature. And by the time it was, it, it seemed like it was pretty, it was pretty, I don't know. It's supposed to be kind of dry, but how do you, what point do you know, or how do you check the temperature to make sure it gets up above where it needs to be? Yeah, I've got a uh, I've got a grill smoker. It's like a, it's a Camp Chef one that you can. I think the only difference between those and like all the Traegers and all that stuff that everybody's all about is that this one you can pull back a, a a cover and you can get like direct flame on to grill stuff, flame grill stuff if you want. But it has it actually has like temperature probe attachments, and I think there's different. Um, there's a lot of different stuff out there that you know, for, for me, temp check and stuff. And, and for me smoking, like it's been you know, a learning curve and I'm still kind of a novice at it, but it seems like stuff really, and there, I mean, there's an art to it and cooking sausages and stuff like that to where to, you can, so you can get it up to temperature, but you don't want to get it up to temperature too fast or it can get dried out. And, you know, as the closer you get to that temperature that you want, the slower it's going to be because you're trying to like not have your your air be or your smoke be too hot, um, yeah. It's kind of it's a it's a learning curve for sure. But uh, I'm I'm enjoying doing it, and that's that's how I. Long story short, that's how I do it. I cheat. I got a temperature probe that I can plug right into my grill. That's perfect. And show me and keep an eye on it. Yeah. And my first batch was it was fine. You know, it was it was it was dry. It wasn't great, but at least it was something that I could eat. It wasn't absolutely catastrophically ruined to the point where, you know. Yeah. yeah, it was inedible. So you know, it was nice that the starting point was good enough to eat, but uh, definitely have a long way to go with that. Yeah, yeah, no, and that's part of the journey. I mean, I, well, I really, a guy, I really ought to like build a big, a big smoker, you know, and it'd be nice for for doing this sausage. Have a have a big stand up smoker that you can hang stuff in, and I think you would get a little bit more even more even thing with that grill it's it, it's it's a awesome tool but it's not perfect either these sausage sticks you know i've, I've kind of got the whole like casing you know sometimes coiled or, or just woven back and forth and back and forth across the grate and the stuff that's on the outside tends to i'll, t- I'll usually burn a little bit of it it'll get a little bit too hot and too dry because the heat's coming up around the outside um, so it's not perfect, but, and, and, you know, ideally one of these days I could, I could build a nice, a nice little smoker, especially if I was doing a lot of fish or a lot of sausage, it would be really handy. After years of fine print contracts and getting ripped off by big wireless providers, if we've learned anything, it's that there's always a catch. So when I first heard that Mint Mobile offers premium wireless starting at just 15 bucks a month, I thought, what's the catch? But after talking to them and using their service, it all made sense. There isn't one. Mint Mobile's secret sauce is that they're the first company to sell wireless service online only. They cut out the cost of retail stores and pass those sweet savings directly to you. For anyone who hates their phone bill, Mint Mobile offers premium wireless for just 15 bucks a month. I was hesitant about having to get a new phone and a new phone number, but with Mint, You can use your own phone with any Mint Mobile plan and keep your same phone and your same phone number along with all of your existing contacts. Mint Mobile gives you the best rate whether you're buying for one or for a family, and at Mint, families start at two lines. 
All plans come with unlimited talk and text plus high-speed data delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. Switch to Mint Mobile and get premium wireless service starting at just 15 bucks a month. To get your new wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month and to get the plan shipped to your door for free, go to mintmobile.com slash waypoint. That is mintmobile.com slash waypoint. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash waypoint. Yeah, some of the people back on Prince of Wales, I, I, they have some, some smokers just built perfectly, exactly what they wanted to the size they wanted. They can... And they just got it so dialed in, and you're just pretty jealous, and it makes you just want to, yeah, just want to. Why don't you give me some, and then uh, I don't have to yeah. go through yeah. all the trouble. But at yeah. some point, like now, I, I need to figure out how to do this because it'd be nice to not have to rely on other people. Yeah, and I think you know, and I think if a guy's willing to do the research, um, you you know, you could find ways to make a pretty a pretty affordable, good like heavy duty smoker, especially living down where you do, you know, with the access to all the fish and stuff like that. There's a lot of that. A lot of that stuff's really good smoked. I mean, everyone likes smoked salmon, but um, some of the best smoked fish I ever have. Do you guys have those black bass, those yep. black rock fish yeah. down there? Those are phenomenal smoked too. They're they're kind of underrated. It was until the last couple of years, you know, when halibut population is a little bit down, that that guides really started targeting those because you're getting a really great white fish that a lot of people like for for tacos, for smoked, for anything. And it's, um, Oh yeah. Yeah. That's, that's definitely been great. Yeah. You know, and they're in, they're small and they're easy to catch. So, you know, you don't get a ton of meat off of them, but I, I mean, I think they're, I, they're as good as any fish I've ever eaten. You know, those, those ones, I think, I think they're highly underrated. Well, you don't have to worry about if you catch a really big one, it's still going to taste good. You know, you catch some of those really huge yep. halibut They're it's cool. It's a great picture, but then you have you have this really fat chunk of fillet that can be difficult to to manage to handle, and the the texture is yeah. a little bit off. Same thing with a lingcod, um, but yeah, those things. Yeah. it's a very consistent taste, um, and you can catch you know quite a few of them. They're pretty easy to find. They don't make for a great picture, but yeah. you know if you're out there to get food, then that's what it's about. Yeah, well, especially compared to stuff like yellow eye. I mean, that stuff's really good, but there's, you know, I mean, all over the state, a lot of those rockfish rigs have tightened down, it seems like. I don't follow it too close, but, you know, it seems like it's really tightened down in areas and those, and I don't know that that's really affect those black those black rockfish um, rigs very much. And it seems like, yeah, it seemed like they were always easy. Always easy to find. Yeah, that's the nice thing about it. Like, there's some of the local spots have been pretty fished out once everybody kind of went to that. Uh, but, yeah. you know, it's it's it's, it's, it's weird. Um, it makes you wish that uh, we kind of knew exactly what was going on, you know, and that's kind of the thing. You know, people want to try certain things, but – or just, you know, regulate certain things. It's just, it's just weird. It's, it's, it's tough to know uh, what's going on. It's got to be just a yeah. combination of a lot of different things, and so to point the finger in one direction is pretty crazy. And, um, yeah. yeah, you know, we saw that you know last week with uh, with the the articles were circulating about um, up north and the closure of those areas. You know, you want to blame blame not being able to get easy caribou on the fact that there's you know non locals hunting it, but you know that's probably not the yeah. real issue, but. Yeah, well, and, and that's, yeah, and I just actually earlier this morning talked to, had Larry Bartlett over and, and did a podcast with him because he's, he's a lot more invested in that area and educated on the issues of that area than I am. And it's, you know, it, you're going to get a different take from, from everybody, but, you know, it's, it's, there's anecdotes of like that the caribou don't even typically show up in a lot of those areas until later, historically anyway, you know, it's, it's. It, you know, it's, I think just humans natural tendency is, you know, if, if I was in the situation and you get a few good years where caribou are all over the place early, you know, and then something changes, you're going to look for something to blame, you know, because it was nice and you're going to look for a cause when sometimes you can find the cause and sometimes they just do what they, you know, critters and things happen because they happen. There's no, no explanation that, that you can control or have an effect on, you know? Yeah. That, that local point of view is so important because you have the opportunity to observe things and tendencies. And if you've been the long, been there longer than about, you know, five, 10 years, 
you can see cycles and if you've taken notes and you have some observations then you can be a really good um, provide really good insight but also you can have that bias that you know you start pointing fingers rather than just yeah you know let's let's really look at what was going on um, I was just looking at, at steelhead right now because that's what what kind of the big thing is for April and you know, four years ago it was super super nice and warm and I'd only been in Ketchikan three years at that point and so I figured okay this is the first week of April is the time to get the steelhead because the water is is up a little bit. It's warmer, and I had these pictures in the background. You had some budding leaves, but that ended up being like the norm um, was cold, and that ended up being yeah, kind of yeah. a um, you know an anomaly that it was that 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 it was that warm, and the the natural cycle went back, and you know it's more like a mid to late April where it start to get warmer, and you get the the buds on the on the trees and on the bushes and things like that. So what I thought was the norm ended up being the exception to the rule, and so it can kind of you can kind of trick yourself too into <laughs> making um, assumptions about uh, the way things are when it's really not the case. Yeah, yeah, no, and that that issue up there, man, it's 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 a complex one, but it's it's pretty scary, you know, the prospect that you know they could close off all that stuff, and then they have done there's been similar stuff happen and it's, it's just kind of a cyclical effort, um, to, to, you know, keep non-residents out or not, not, not just non-residents, but non-locals. And, uh, yeah, it's unfortunate. You know, you don't want to throw anybody under the bus cause I can, I can sympathize or empathize with the local perspective too. But at the same time, you gotta, you know, you kind of got, you gotta be fair. And if, and if, and, if the what you know what they're claiming to be going on isn't actually going on, there's no reason to there's no reason to to shut it down for everybody. Yeah, I'm all for you know people in a certain area having first shot at things. That just seems reasonable because you live there. But you know if it is yeah. trying attempting to turn public land into private just because you want it to be easier, then that's just. You know, this the art, second article that you wrote last week, or maybe it was earlier this week, I don't know what, which week it was, we were talking about the, how we put ourselves in a different categories. Um, yeah. Subsistence versus sport versus trophy. Do you think it's kind of the chicken and the egg? Did we do that, or was that – like, who put us in the categories? Was that our doing, or was that – how did that happen? You know, I, I don't know exactly, and a lot of that – um, you know, that whole Anilka, Anilka deal was, a lot of it was to protect the interest of, of people who traditionally are subsistence hunter and subsist, hunters and subsist off that stuff. And I guess naturally you have to define what a subsistence hunter is. And, uh, you know, they do it by location, essentially, which, which kind of sucks because there's people in a lot of quote unquote non-rural areas that eat a ton of wild game and, you know, you may, you know, you or me, maybe we may be able to, we have a store available. We can go down and buy food if we need to, but we prefer to, you know, source our wild meat and fish, you know, rather than, rather than buy it. But, you know, what, at what, at what, what point do you make that argument? Cause basically any, any community that's any connected, connected, you know, it's, it's not like people are going to starve to death. You know, there's, there's ways to get food you know, they may not be easy or optimal. And I'm not saying in any way that the people shouldn't be able to like live a, as much of a subsistence lifestyle as they can, but it's kind of a, where you, where do you draw the line? And a lot, I know a lot of, you know, it's irritating. I'd like to go, you know, spring waterfowl hunting sometimes. If I live 50 miles down the road, I would be able to, but I can't, you know, and, and part of that's a choice too, but at, at the same time, that's, there's a little bit of arbitrary or, or I don't know if it's arbitrariness is an actual word. Maybe you could tell me that, but uh, <laughs> there, it's kind of the, the you know some of the part of these these qualifications are, are somewhat arbitrary and you know stuff like this closure. It's just it's irritating, even though I don't have any plans to go up there hunting because it's you know it's it's all of our land, you know to to be all cliche about it. You know it's all of our land, and if you know. The, the regulations are specifically targeted to keep or the, to keep non-residents out and there's even state current state regulations in certain rural areas that are 
you know, you it doesn't take a it doesn't take a rocket scientist to to figure out that they're that the way things are done are to you know limit non-local participation and you know kind of it, it is what it is you can like it or you don't like it um but i think you know i found it with that article i found it interesting this whole contemporary like movement to be you know that the, the food hunter and that's the cool thing and i you know and that's how we sell hunting and i i get that but hunting is also about a lot a hell of a lot more than just the food to any any hunter you know even if that is like you know that's one of the biggest motivations for any you know any person that enjoys hunting it's not just about the food and that it's a it's an important component of it but when you make that the sole the sole motivator or the sole you know the sole goal of it then it diminishes hunting i think too we have a lot of lines that are readily accessible to us that are the right things to say in those moments. And I've been guilty of that too, where you just think, oh, you know, it's not even about the hunt. And you think, wait, no, it is about that. Because if it yeah. wasn't, then yeah. I wouldn't be here right now. And you see those on some of that, the content when people go out hunting somewhere and they're up in the mountains, they're like, you know, it's not even about the hunting. It's about getting up to the mountains. It's like, well, you're yeah. not doing this in June, right? You're doing this now because there's something to hunt. So I don't think there's anything wrong with, with that. And uh, we saw, I saw this in the pandemic a couple of times where, you know, students during the weekends were going out hunting and it was just that, I mean, is there a better, more, more healthy thing, productive, purposeful thing for kids to be doing than going out hunting during the pandemic? It was, you know, we didn't have school on Friday when we were at 50% uh, capacity. And so, you know, some of my students were like, well, I'm not going to show up to office hours. I'm going to go hunting. I'm thinking. That's great. That that's an app. That's a great use of time because you're outside. You're getting your exercise. You're appreciating nature. You're you're bringing home food. Like the whole experience. I mean, those rites of passage type things are so important for the development of people, and that's why we yeah. have so many people who, you know, are lost because they don't have anything else, and so they, they get caught up in like a, it's not really a purpose. It's more of like a distraction or like some some political fandom or something, and it's not. Yeah. anything that gives them any feeling of self-worth or anything that that's challenging. And, um, you know, it's, it's hard to really describe why we do what we do. You know, people are going to take one word and, you know, just flip it however they want. So, yeah. yeah. Well, and, and it also depends on people's, you know, people's worldview and this, in the lens that they look at things through, you can only control so much of what you what you present, and you know it's good to you present hunting in a in a positive light. But you also you can't lie to people either, <laughs> you know. It, and you can only you can only do the best you can. And some people just aren't, you know. You can tell them something fifty ways to Sunday, and they just might not understand because of their the lens they view the world through. Um, they're you know what you're they're not they're not catching what you're pitching type of deal. Um, and I certainly don't have all the answers, but I, you know, I've seen th there is a real kind of effort to split trophy hunters from food hunter in at all sorts of different levels. Some, some I think are, is, is intentional to that divide and conquer type deal. Um, but it's, it's concerning when people just, you can't, you know, just try to, uh, singularly define themselves as a hunter is one is a is like basically one factor or one thing that makes them a hunter like it's it's just the food well it's not just about the food and if you're telling people that then you're lying to them <laughs> and and even 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 the discouraging of of you know what what some people would call trophy hunting you know like it, you know you heard heard on a recent podcast you know after explaining i wrote this in that article after explaining how you measure a bear skull you know how people like quantify how you measure a bear skull to get the number that people quantify and you know it's and now you've reduced that animal to a number which that's not that's not what goes on you know it and goes on to well you'd be better off in the kitchen which i agree you know yeah go eat that stuff and share the meat and tell the people about it and all that but because you might be interested in harvesting a big mature animal doesn't mean that you aren't interested in in all this other stuff too or that all this other stuff isn't important to you too you know it's 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 a complex thing and it just i don't know it always irks me when 
this division gets sown and kind of you kind of force people to pick a camp so to speak when we're all we're all basically out there doing this stuff for the same reasons yeah are, are the semantics end up being the huge point and it's like that person says well you've reduced the bear to just a number well no you did because your interpretation of everything that i said ended up being filtered in your way because you voluntarily yeah. Like you're a writer and a podcaster, so <laughs> that that's that's yeah. double the opportunity at least of, for people to to twist the words, take things the wrong way, and invite criticism. So, how do you do? You, are you worried about that at all? Is it just something that you can shrug off now, or or do you still get stuff that just makes you think, dude, what the heck? No, I I still get irritated sometimes, but for the most part, like. No, I don't know. Most stuff doesn't bother me, and and the stuff that you know does get the flack. I do catch sometimes. Most of it's not. It's it's like so ridiculous that it's not even worth addressing. You know, if if I say if I say something stupid or write something stupid, or someone has you know is it has a, a rebuttal or is willing to you know tell me why I'm wrong, and I can you know see that. Like I I'm. I, I like to think, I mean, maybe everyone does, but I like to think I, I can admit when I'm wrong. And, you know, maybe if I say something I shouldn't have said or something was taken out of context or the wrong way, you know, I, you know, I'm willing to accept some criticism and work with that. You know, it's just the stuff that's kind of off the cuff, ridiculous that, that makes me roll my eyes a little bit, but I've, I've had to get grow pretty thick skin and, uh, you know, Frankly, the, frankly, my podcast. I'm surprised it doesn't get more get more flack, you know, because it's a little bit a uh, little bit rough around the edges. I would say some of the stuff that there's been a couple, you know, a little bit of feedback that I just kind of, you know, I didn't really know what what to make of it or what exactly people were talking about. But uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm, but I, I am a little surprised I don't get a little more a little more negative feedback because you you can never keep everybody happy, and when you're a little do stuff a little rough around the edges then uh that can sometimes get people riled up a little bit i think with with writing and i i do the same thing with my columns i th knowing that people could take it the wrong way definitely helps me with my diligence to think yeah all right uh, what's i want to make sure i word this correctly so to, not to please anybody and not to self-censor or anything like that but let's make sure that i do my diligence and make sure that i word this correctly so that a person who's reasonable might not misinterpret this. Um, so I think it, it, I think it's oh. a good challenge as a writer, but with the podcast, it is funny because, you know, you think you said something, but maybe something else uh, is what's presented. But I'm not sure if a lot of people are spending an extra hour out of their day to listen through everything, to find yeah. that one line to take out of context. But Yeah. Yeah, no. And, and it's funny you mentioned that. And that's one, one thing I like about writing and I struggle with podcasting. I feel like I've improved and in, in doing a podcast has helped me improve both my, just my conversation, my, you know, conversation skills in general. I'm, I'm still not all that articulate. I've, I've lear learned on my podcast or, or, and my wife's told me, is <laughs> she's telling me you need to, you know, you just get, you just talk too much and you, you monopolize the conversation. And so that's like been a good reminder to me to just like shut up and try, you know, try to talk when I need to talk, but let, and I feel like I've improved in that way. Maybe I haven't that much, but, um, I, it's one thing I enjoy about writing is, is I can take the time. I mean, I'm a little, I'm a little s slow between the ears most of the time. You know, I'm I'm one of the, I'm the guy that like three days after a conversation comes up with the zinger that would have been perfect <laughs> in the moment. Um, so you know, write writing articles and it, it, and I've been doing it for quite a few years. So it's it's just a matter of repetition and practice. Um, I feel I I, I kind of agree with you. There's the long what I'm what I'm getting at. It, it lets me really analyze what I'm trying to say like the point I'm trying to get across and what words do I need to use to say it in as clear and articulate a way as I can. I think the, with the podcast thing, you know, you're listening to other podcasts, you can kind of break down what you like about it. Not just like someone said something that was funny and I laughed. It's like, well, what about this podcast was good? And it was, it's kind of interesting to look at that. And there's some podcasts that are kind of a Q and a 
that are great, some that are terrible, yeah. yeah, some solo podcasts that are awful, and some that are great, and then some long podcast, yeah. and that's. But there's always some sort of takeaway, and it's always interesting. One of the things I like about your podcast is it's not just guys talking. Like there's a lot of insight and a lot of information you can you can glean from it. It's not just a whole bunch of you had to be there type stories, and so that's that's. I don't know if that's an intentional type thing, but it's it's an organic, but but educational type uh, type round table, um, uh, if you will. So that's yeah. uh, that, that's pretty sweet. So it's nice to have podcasts that you know it's not just I'm daring you to listen to it because it's just a bunch of crap for two hours. It's yeah, yeah. you know, but. Yeah, yeah, no, that's and that's somewhat intentional. I don't know if that's you know. Obviously, I I had no idea what I was doing starting out with it, and no idea what I wanted to my podcast to be. Um, so just kind of started. It actually have probably have probably loosened up over the time that I've been doing it. On like a lot of times, there's no there's no script or plan. You know, if there are certain things I want to talk about, I'll have them written down you know there's if i if i'm like talking to you know like a one-on-one podcast with someone that i don't maybe not don't know real well or whatever i'm not the i'm not real good at pulling stories you know at pulling stories from people and every everyone's different too and that's what's so fun about talking to different people is you know so you know some people you got to work to like get them to tell these awesome stories they have and some people it's, you know, it's just natural and I can just say, Hey, how's it going? And then they, you know, and shut my mouth and, and let them talk. And, uh, but, but yeah, when, especially when it's all of us just, just shooting the breeze together, it, uh, we, it, it is an effort to make, you know, provide some useful information as well. I mean, if, if people can enjoy, enjoy just the conversation, but we can also provide useful stuff or whether it's a piece of gear we've been using or a technique or something like that you know that's what that's what i would i would like it to be anyway there's always those people that you either see at the store or you know at the marina or something like that where a group of three or four people are just waiting to one up each other about stories and it's just like this sort of oh man it's all you're not listening at all this is just yeah. you can't wait to talk to one up someone else, and so it's. I think you got a good bunch of guys, and I like to have people on my podcast too. That it's not just going to be about, uh, you know, a forty-five minute ego stroke. I, I'm not sure that yeah. that's super uh, beneficial to any sort of readers. And if you go in, you know, just for that. Same thing with writing. You know, if you're just going out yeah. there to write to tell everybody yeah. how great you are, then I don't. I don't think that's 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 the route that uh, you want to do. So, a, a budding writers or budding podcasters, you know, not that we're Joe Rogan, um, but you know, I think that's an important thing. That's what that's what I like to to listen to, and that's what I like to to read. And I think that's the biggest thing is finding things that you like, and then you can kind of use that as an example or or something. Yeah, and people that just like share, just like sharing the experiences, you know, just like. Just like writing, you know, just similar to writing. That's why I like writing, and I, I particularly like writing stories, you know, um, stuff that, you know, the hunts and stuff like that that I've been on because it, it helps me relive it. And, I you know, I, I like telling it because I can relive it, and but it also shares that experience. And then, you know, usually – and that, those are some of my favorite ones where, you know, we're fresh off a hunt or something and we go down all sorts of different – get to relive all sorts of different details. There's stuff. Yeah. I think about hunts I did a long time ago that there's no, you know, I didn't write anything down about them. And, you know, a lot of that, a lot of that, uh, nuance and details kind of lost, you know, it's gone. I can remember a lot of the basics, but it's, uh, it's, it's tough to remember that. So it's, it's fun to be able to share that and like really, you know, you let people know what you're, what you're thinking, what you're feeling, um, as well as more technical, like stuff that people, information that people can use. Some of my first outdoor columns, I would spend like the, I, it is just a chronological thing. So by the time it got to even us getting to the river, I was already like 500 words in. I'm like, oh, yeah. I'm exhausted. I'm like, this is, yeah. this is pretty terrible. This, this, this column actually sucks. So it's kind of focused on, okay, what's the main point? What details do I need? What details do I need to leave out? Because they're not yeah. important to it. And as a reader, you know, you, you pick up certain things and you latch on to certain things. And if something ends up not being important, it just ends up being confusing. So 
Uh, I think that's one of the biggest things that I've grown in writing and it helps kind of consolidate the memory a little bit, I think. So it's just those, those needed details that you, that you keep going forward. Oh yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and it's interesting, you know, story like reading writing that I did a long time ago. Cause I'm by, I'm in no way, shape or form a professionally trained writer. It's been kind of, you know, a lot of reading other writers. So I feel like I've developed my own style of writing, but maybe it's just like copied bits and pieces from other stuff. You know, like a lot of stories I'll do, you'll, you'll do the, and it's kind of common in a lot of stories. You, you know, you start with a, like in the pre-climax, like key to the moment type thing or pull from a certain experience and then step back and go through it. You know, that's, that's old as dirt and old as dirt, but it does seem to, it does seem to work. And I try, you know, I, I like, I like the structure of it or, or visualizing a structure of how I want a piece to look when I'm, when I'm writing it. I mean, that's, this is all just like boring details, but, but I don't get to geek out about it very often. And if I knew, if I knew growing up that I'd be geeking out about writing stuff, then I, don't know what I would have done, but yeah, here I am. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's 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 fun to look back at that though, and just you know have something else that's going on. Um, yeah, it's fun to have that voice. But uh, yeah. yeah, so um, back to I want to finish up. I, I think I remembered a couple of the questions I had about the the bear program. Um, I saw that yeah. you had you had um, when I was up at your place a couple uh, grizzly bears that were that were hanging. Um, do you have any like full mounts or shoulder mounts or what do you do with most of the, most of the hides? No, I have a, I, I have a, I have a rug that I, I got made off a, a brown bear I killed on the peninsula is about a nine and a half foot bear. Um, that's at my, it's at my, I have a couple bear rugs at my uncle's place. I don't have room for them currently, but, um, I have one, the biggest interior grizzly I've ever killed. He supposed my taxidermist has him. We're talk, we've been talking about doing a life-size mount of him for years. I don't know where I'd put it, but, uh, you know, maybe, maybe I'll elect to do just a half body or maybe I'll go get it. But it was a huge bear. He was like, um, yeah, I'm, I'm such a trophy hunter that he was, he was like number six in the Pope and young when I killed him. Um, and he just had a really nice hide too. He had one tiny little rub above his tail, and that time of year it can be kind of tough to find find bears, especially big bears that aren't all rubbed up and stuff like that. So I tend, I think you know, I'll mount have may have a mount made out of him one way or another. I probably should just to do him justice, you know. Um, the rest of my the rest of my grizzlies, for the most part, I just get them tanned and like having them hang and most of them have rubs here or there and i kind of get some people it doesn't bother i i handled a lot of fur did a lot of fur skinning so i became pretty much an expert at finding damage and seeing different and i've you know taxidermy prepped a ton of bears so i get to you know i get i have gotten pretty picky about as far as bears i would do something with i still love hunting them and i still you know i still look for mature bears and stuff like that good bears to take that are you know probably as far as grizzly bears bears that are out there killing moose calves um but no i mean as far as me like all i'll taxidermy prep them and put them up and get them tanned but uh you know how many how many how many grizzly bear mounts does a guy need (laughs) Yeah. Well, as far as uh, skinning and things like that, like what, um, is there like a particular knife or technique or any sort of, of thing that you've learned that's been, uh, that's pretty beneficial. Like I've, I've only, I've only done two. And, um, the first one I used like a regular hunting knife the other time with more of a narrow, um, there's a little, ha- one of those Havlon with uh, replacement blades. Is there, is there any, any, anything that's really worked for you? Yeah, I've got it. I mean, I've got to go th- go through a few knives. Um, uh, as far as just uh, uh, in the field knife, most of the time when I'm bear hunting, I'm pretty not too far from my boat, so I can carry more stuff. I can carry a couple knives. I you know, and sheep hunting and, and backpack hunting. I'll usually I've been the past few years carry a Havilon and a fixed blade, like a Benchmade Altitude, like one of those real bare bones. And there's a, there's actually there's in recent years quite a few good like either replaceable blade or fixed blade knives that are just ultra light and really good um 
and I'll do most of the like most of the skinning and rough work with a fixed blade knife, and then um, the fine detail caping and stuff like that with a with a Havlon, just because you it's just really hard to beat in the field to beat those those razor knives for for real detail work. Um, when I get stuff back to the back to the shop, um, and I'm actually like taxidermy prepping hides or skin and fur, you know, wolves, cats, stuff like that. I I like to use a uh, they're just a cheap Victorinox pairing knives. You see them a lot on uh, uh, f- fishing boats and stuff. The the you see the serrated ones on fishing boats, but just the non serrated like three and a half inch pairing knife. And, you know, last time I bought some, they were like six or seven bucks a piece. They're cheap knives, but if you get good at sharpening knives, you get either like a jewel, like a three-sided jewel stick or a good ceramic and a steel. You know, you can keep those things really sharp and they've got a nice flexible blade that's pretty, you're not going to break the blades. They're a pretty tough blade, but they're flexible and they're really light knife. You can, you can control them really well. Like on a lot of detail work, I'll hold the blade kind of like a pencil between my index finger and thumb and just you can have really really tight control as opposed to if you're back here on the handle on a big hunt knife trying to work on something that's four inches away from your hand um you know some guys use uh like exacto knives or utility knives you know same kind of principle just boils down to what your taste but i i started using those a long time ago as my taxidermist he he taught me i mean basically everything i know about about taxidermy prep and stuff like that i worked halfway as an indentured servant to him for a while but uh i you know those knives and for skin and feet like on bear on bears it's pretty common in the field to uh you know when you're skinning them it's the fastest way is to make all your cuts and skin them and then knock the feet off and leave the feet in the hide at the at the ankle joint you don't need to saw them or nothing you just cut the cut the tendons break the joints and uh then you can you can pack the hide out and and deal with it at home and so whether it's bare feet or wolf feet you know I like to you know partially skin the foot and then hang it up by I take a big halibut hook and grind the barb off and hang it by some some cord from my my skin and hook or winch or whatever and hook that into the foot and then you use the weight of the hide pulling on there to make to make skinning the foot a lot easier and it takes practice but I mean there's I skinned hundreds and hundreds of wolf feet and, and there's not, oh, I have yet to find a better way to do it. Um, that's one trick. And then he also taught me how to use, uh, how to make, make my own and use Ulu's for fleshing. And I don't use them exclusively. I went for like a year. I did everything with Ulu just to really learn it well. And for fur stuff and some animals, I find it beneficial to use a, a big draw knife. Um, you know, fur bearers, wolves and cats and stuff like that. I like using a dull side and actually pushing the, the flesh off. Whereas um, if you get a big fatty um, prime bear, like early spring or late fall, where the hide's nice and thick and they got a bunch of fat, you know, you can use just a razor. You know, I get like a razor sharp, shaving sharp edge on, on the sharp side of that draw knife and literally use on the flesh and beam, shave that stuff off. And it, it's basically like using, I do it in a similar way, like using a big Ulu. It just gives you a, a lot more leverage and, and ability to cover to cover territory on your flesh and beam. But um, um, the biggest thing, I always use a, I have a tiny little Ulu I made, and I use that for doing the faces and fleshing the faces on everything because I just have a lot of, I have a lot of control with that and I can, not, you know, where's a big draw knife or a big Ulu, you know, you can ding holes in eyes and sensitive parts, stuff like that. So I don't know if that answers the question, but th- that's a few things that I've learned over the years that have really helped me out. No, that's great. Yeah, that actually, uh, the, the follow-up questions I have to that you addressed. So that uh, that was that was perfect. That's got after it. Oh, nice. Nice, yeah. And, and having a good flesh and beam, man. Having a good, I don't know, you know, stuff like, dealing with stuff like bears and big game you know there's you you can do it without a flesh and beam but if you're not going to want to do very much of it it's just so much it it, it, and doing that stuff it takes time the only way to learn it is to do it you know i told a buddy that caught some wolverines this winter and telling me man are these things just a horrible pain in the butt or am i you know and i said well yep that's only you just got to do it man that's the only way you're you're you really 
can learn is hands on to get the feel for it. But yeah, and that's the other thing. Just me even having a good flesh and beam for big critters. I just made one out of a a uh, a washed up you know a log I cut out of a pile tangle of a uh, just drift logs on a river bar, on a sandbar and cut it in half and shaped it and fur critters I like using a PVC board because their skin's a lot thinner and and um, that wood doesn't the imperfections in the wood make it a little and the, it's a little bit softer and the imperfections in the wood surface um, don't quite give me quite as a clean a clean and smooth a bite you know flesh in them if that makes sense you can get I'll, I'll be careful you got to steer me out because I'll just dive way down the rabbit hole of that. <laughs> No, that's good. You're finding that, that that wheelhouse, you know, that's just a lot of knowledge. And a lot of those things that you learn about that it, it gets filed away somewhere. And then later on, it comes to mind and think, oh, that's what, uh, that's what they meant. To, that, that's what they meant about that. So, yeah. yeah. That's good. Well, uh, I kept you for a little over an hour since uh, we had all those technical difficulties. So you got, uh, you got any sort of closing thoughts or, uh, or uh, anything? I don't know, man. You know, it's, I guess I would just tell, you know, I, I don't know when you'll, you'll have this one posted, but, um, I think it's important people call into that, call into that meeting for the, uh, caribou, you know, that caribou closure, potential closure and, and, you know, let them know what, let them know what you think about that. I think, uh, you know, you can only do, you only have control over so much and you can only do what you do. But I think there's been a lot of, a lot of people made aware of these issues that have been brewing up there for years and years. So that's nice. You know, I, I don't normally give a bunch of pitches for stuff, but, but that's a pretty important one. And yeah, man, I just, yeah, looking forward to spring and looking forward to see what you get into this spring. And uh, yeah, appreciate you. Appreciate you having me on, man. Yeah, I'm, uh, it's it's great uh, great to have you. I'm glad uh, I was able to to be on yours when uh, we're up there and just see that that Fairbanks program. You know, you hear about stuff, so you go up there and get to see kind of the local view of it. You know, rather than you know go up stay in a hotel yeah. or something like that. You know, it's nice to to kind of have a different idea about what Alaska is and see that inside. And um, yeah, it'll be it'll be hopefully I have some good stuff, uh, some good stories to tell, and have a bunch of questions about uh, how to. How to smoke, prepare uh, some some sausage sticks, man? Because I I love those. Those things are so great. Get a whole bunch. Um, oh yeah, they're like cocaine. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's so yeah. good. Not that I would know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, all right, man. Well, thanks. Yeah. Uh, thanks for being on here. Really appreciate it. And um, we'll, uh, we'll be yeah. touch. Yeah, sounds good.